breathing, something we all do all the time without really thinking much about it. My guest, Melissa Prieto, is a certified Oxygen Advantage coach and sports performance coach working specifically with MMA fighters who incorporates breath work into her training protocols with these amazing athletes. Melissa explains how these breathwork techniques can actually help us in our performance, in our stress management, and even our sleep. So take a deep breath, and let's get into it. Thank you for joining me today for another episode of Hunger and Feast. With me today is Melissa Prieto. Prieto, did I say that correct? Yeah, that's correct. All right, thanks. Melissa <laughs> is a sports performance coach. She's also a certified oxygen advantage coach and works specifically with uh, MMA fighters, which is pretty cool, pretty interesting. That's uh, the hot sport of the of the year, really. Okay. At least the last five years, really. I mean, it's just grown like crazy. So you're in the right place. Yeah, it's pretty brand new. So it's basically 27 years. So it's a brand new sport. So, and it is growing at a fast pace. Honestly, there's a lot of new upcoming fighters and athletes. So yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> oh yeah, everybody wants it. Everyone wants to see it. It's the it's uh, attention grabber. So how how did you get to start working with MMA fighters? So I've always been into sports and I've been involved into sports like for a long time. Um, I used to play tennis at a professional level. So oh. I've always been, you know, surrounded by, you know, athletes and sports and even myself um, as an athlete as well. And I used to practice Muay Thai and boxing um, a long time ago. And I've always been into that sport, you know, the combat sport side of it, very mm -hmm. interested about it. And I just started noticing there was a lot of gaps, you know, in terms of strength and conditioning wise on how these guys used to prepare. So, you know, I started noticing and start to dig in a little bit more on how they prepare for fights and how do they do it, um, what comes into play. So that's kind of a, how I started to getting into that sport. So at the place that I used to train, I started working along with a, a couple of professional fighters. And a couple of months later, um, I got an invitation to attend to a seminar at the UFC Performance Institute in Las Vegas. Wow. So <laughs> after attending that seminar and, you know, getting the opportunity to work with those people in the UFC and the professionals that are working one-on-one um, -on -one with the best fighters in the world. So that for me, that was kind of, a, you know, the platform or the place for me to just start working really uh, with professional fighters. So that was kind of it, how I started working in combat sports world. So what specifically do you do with the fighters? So basically the sports performance side of it, which is strength and conditioning, um, you know, programming, how to program that around technical training. So my side would be the non-technical side of, of training for them, but um, I play a role where I can manage or organize their training sessions around technical and non-technical training. So it's a lot of work, actually, um, that comes into play. It's very interesting. So you're writing their strength and performance, strength and conditioning yeah. workouts. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And then you're also, like I said, that's really cool, actually, because those are like the like high-end uh I mean, athletes that just, they put out so much <laughs> on the mat. I mean, it's like such an output of energy and strength and endurance, and, and they're taking a beating at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there aren't many more, there aren't many better conditioned athletes out there than MMA fighters. They're the, That's the most true. conditioned athletes in, 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 in professional sports. Uh, and, and you figure out all around conditioning, they, they, they have to have it all. And so that's quite a responsibility for you. It is for sure. And you know what? It is funny because uh, the thing is, it's such a brand new sport that it's still a lot of, you know, myths and paradigms around the sport. So even a lot of professional fighters are not doing strength and conditioning training the right way, um, which 
might surprise you, but honestly, a lot of them just focus on the technical side of training, which is boxing, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, grappling, you know, wrestling. Um, however, um, it is starting to change and the fighters are noticing that they really need to, you know, work on their strength and conditioning because uh, as you know, as coaches, we are able to help them in better ways on how to organize their schedule. Because mm. sometimes uh, even the technical coaches don't know how to program around everything. Because there's a lot of things going on with these guys. You sometimes have three sessions a day and each one of them, it's different at a different pace, different volume of training, intensity, and so on. So for me as a strength and conditioning coach, I have the ability to show the fighter, listen, um, it's probably better if you have this session on the morning and then you can have strength and conditioning later on the day so you don't, you know, overtrain or overreach. So that's kind of it. Right. Well, yeah, you've got to balance that with everything else they're doing, sleep schedule, eating schedule, all that kind of stuff. Wow. That's amazing. And uh, what do you... Now, how do you incorporate the oxygen advantage with that? What do you what do you do with them? So basically what I do is I, I make oxygen advantage a part of my program because okay. they have a lot of things going on daily. Um, so for me to put something else on top of everything, it'll be too much. So what I do is I try to implement that into our training sessions. So they either uh, can apply that during strength and conditioning or during technical sessions. So if we're talking about, let's say strength and conditioning, we can apply that during movement prep, which is the warm up. so and so. We can do that intraset recovery. Um, sometimes we do shadow boxing and there's a way that we can apply breath work techniques. Um, even during certain exercises, we do stronger breath holds so we can stimulate altitude training. Mm -hmm. So that's another way that I like to implement the, you know, oxygen advantage. Even during, let's say, um, Muay Thai session, we can do altitude training as well as they're performing and for doing certain drills. So what I like about oxygen advantage is that it's so flexible that you can apply it in so many ways or depending with the athlete that you're working with. So it's so versatile that there's no, it's not like just one tool that you have available. So you have many ways to implement, you know, breath work into your training. Great. Well, if you don't mind, let's, let's maybe back up a little bit and explain to the listeners what oxygen advantage is and what specifically you know, the, the benefits of that, of, of all the aspects of that technique, that breathing technique and that kind of breath work. Sure. So Oxygen Advantage is created by Patrick McMoon. So he is in Ireland. Um, he is such a great guy. He's so smart about it, honestly. Um, and he's been working in this field uh, for over 20 years now, but he has created this great method about how to implement breath work um, either for wellness, fitness, sports performance, or for any other ailment that you might have. So it is not exclusively for sports performance. It is for a vast, you know, variety of things that you can apply that. So basically the mythology focuses on the three pillars of breathing or three fundamentals of breathing. So basically, I don't know if you have seen uh, probably a lot of yoga teachers, they focus sometimes on just one fundamental of breathing. And even on other sports, um, they'd only, they only focus on other pillar or other fundamental. So that's the difference about oxygen advantage. We have three pillars or fundamentals. The first one is the biochemistry. So that's um, how we tolerate CO2. Mm. Okay, that's the first one, and it's very important. Uh, the second one is the biomechanics of it. So, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing vertical breathing. Every time they breathe, they do this, right? You notice the move. And the third one, we have the rhythm or the pace or cadence of breathing. 
So majority of people uh, breathe higher volumes of air or their respiratory rate is way higher than it should, than it should be. So the cadence, um, it'll be six breaths per minute. So you can focus in breathing four seconds in, you hold one second and then you exhale in five. That way you can approach six breaths per minute. So gotcha. those are the three fundamentals. Um, and there's different ways into working around them and in a way of incorporating them into your daily routine and your daily life as well. Because that's something that it, that it's really important. It is not how you breathe during training, but how are you, how are you breathing on your daily life? Mm. That is going to impact your performance. Gotcha. But you you and with the training, you implement some of these pillars into their training, creating another stress point in the training, really, or a train. I shouldn't say a stress point, but it creates a. It, 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 it trains them to breathe and, and to um, take advantage of those uh, of this technique while they're in the moment, while they're, which they're going to have to apply, I would assume, in the ring. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, a, it's another adaptation. It's like yeah. everything. If we're working on hypertrophy, max strength, you know, or endurance, it is the same thing. If you're not working um, with breath work or you have never done that before, it's definitely going to take you time. It's mm -hmm. going to create another adaptation. So it's definitely another stimuli within your training. Right. Right. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. No. So obviously you, you coach beyond the MMA, you're doing some oxygen advantage coaching as well. Yeah, definitely. Non, Non-professional non athletes. Well. Okay. So that's specifically for like, then that would be like for their, just their long longevity, health, in general, general health benefits, um, dealing with stress, I would assume those kind of things. Yeah, of course. I mean, um, I'm, I'm also doing a couple of, you know, uh, webinars and certifications with oxygen advantage and not everything is towards performance. However, I'm the only one in the team working closely with combat sports. So mm. there's other master instructors that are working with uh, yoga, meditation, runners, uh, triathletes, uh, soccer play players. So there's a, a variety in our team, but I'm the one working with combat sports. However, I do certain, you know, um, consultations with other people working in different fields or other sports as well. Do you do that remotely, mostly? Yeah, mostly. You know, okay. nowadays with everything going on, pretty much everything is remotely. But um, as far as fighters, um, most of them, I do that one-on-one, -on -one, but I do work with a lot of fighters remotely as well. So, yeah. Gotcha. And it was worth mentioning, you're, you're, in you're based in Mexico, correct? Yeah, I'm currently here in a city called Guadalajara. Oh, yeah, Guadalajara. All right, I knew that one. Uh, that's, that's great. So a lot of your fighters coming from there? Yeah, there's a lot of fighters based here. Um, even in the north of the country, uh, pretty close from the border, Tijuana, there's a lot of guys there. Um, and here in Guadalajara. So the mo let's say the strongest city in terms of MMA here in Mexico are Tijuana and Guadalajara. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. Great. So let's... Um... Do you mind if we unpack some of these pillars? So a little bit, just so people maybe understand who aren't familiar with um, what, you know, when you mentioned biochemistry and the CO2 and then the chest breathing uh, and as well as the cadence, let's maybe let's, let's break those down a little bit for people who are completely unfamiliar with what you, what you mean. Yeah, of course. Okay. Let's go with the first one. So CO2 tolerance. So CO2, it's more than a waste gas. So we've heard so many times that CO2 is just a waste gas, but it's just a byproduct of, you know, uh, cellular respiration. And of course, the utilization of certain macronutrients in our body. Mm -hmm. So what CO2 does, it's the main catalyst for you to breathe and for oxygen to be released into your um, bloodstream. So we have something or we, we produce something that it's called the Bohr effect. And the Bohr effect means that the higher the CO2 um, 
let's say, um, quantity in your body, mm -hmm. the more your body is ready to release oxygen into your bloodstream uh, from your hemoglobin. So that's why it's really important uh, for us to create that tolerance to CO2, because if we don't tolerate CO2 very well, then we're not going to deliver oxygen into your cells and muscles. Mm. So that's why it's really important to work on CO2 tolerance. And how do we work on that? So the first uh, pillar that we have concentrates on starting to create small air hunger into your body. It is not as strong. It is a small, so your body starts ad adapting and creating a little bit of accumulation of CO2 into your body. So basically, instead of breathing the same volume that you breathe every time, which would be like this, very high, we can do it half by half and then go down and slow down. So that way you start creating small air hunger and preparing your body for creating that tolerance to CO2. That would be the first thing. The second pillar that we have, or the second fundamental, it's biomechanics. So uh, most people breathe vertically or paradox paradoxically, like this. You can notice how, how they move their chest, and even you can notice their breathing, right? Right. So the thing that, that we change is that instead of breathing vertically, we start doing that horizontally. So you need to push your ribs out and push them back in. So as you inhale, your ribs must come out. And as you exhale, they must go in. So that's the way that you can change the biomechanics or the movement of breathing. Right. So a lot of, a lot of times we hear, uh, take a deep breath. Right. And yeah, and a lot of people do this right so that's so far from uh, a deep breathing that means that you're gonna push your ribs out and in sorry i don't know if you heard that yeah a little bit okay but you can hear me right well, i can hear you fine yes okay so that's the way that we change biomechanics sorry for that no problem <laughs> and uh that you can either focus on the on the breathing, the pace, or on the rhythm. But if you just want to focus on that fundamental first, that's okay. There's nothing else that you need to focus on. So what I like to do is I like to focus on each fundamental or, or pillar each time without fo focusing on everything from diaphragmatic, nasal breathing, and a lot of factors that come in. You can work on each and one of them first, and then you can start like bring them all together. Gotcha. And the third one that we have is the pace or the cadence of breathing, which I told you before, it's six breaths per minute. That's like the ideal, let's say respiratory rate. So we focus on four seconds in, you hold one second, and then you exhale in five. So the longer the exhalation, the better, because that is going to create a balance between parasympathetic and, sympath and sympathetic nervous system. So those are the three pillars of breathing. Uh, you can start working first on light uh, breathing, which is CO2 tolerance. Then you can focus on biomechanics, which is deep breathing. And lastly, you can focus on the pace of breathing. So those are the three fundamentals. And as soon as you got them or got the hook of, of all three of them, mm. you can integrate them, all three. So you can work on creating um, a little bit of air hunger with the proper biomechanics and with the proper respiratory rate. So you can bring them all together. And that's what we call light, slow, and deep breathing. Gotcha. And, and it is worth, you mentioned it briefly, but the most of the breathing is through the nose. You, you try to isolate yeah. all breathing in and out of the nose. Totally. Yeah. Nasally. Nasal breathing. As opposed to most, most people, especially if they get in a stressful situation or if they're exercising or they're just in traffic or something disturbs them, they immediately tend to reflex go to mouth breathing. 
Yeah, Usually. that's and correct. Um, quicker, lots of breaths very quickly, which stimulates the sympathetic nervous system more so. True, especially nowadays that we live in a world that it's fast paced and, mm -hmm. you know, we encounter so many um, situations where anxiety creeps in and, you know, we get nervous um, about everything. So a lot of people are mouth breathers and definitely that's something that it's not advisable. It's not going to be good for your health in terms of, let's say that your airways become inflamed. If you're breathing through your mouth all the time, um, your nose is your first filter in terms of, you know, uh, germs or pathogens that are on the air and everything. So your nose is the first line of defense, um, honestly. And if you're doing nasal breathing, you're producing nitric oxide, which is, uh, you know, helps to um, redistribute your blood and your lungs, the oxygen, and especially it protects you from different pathogens in the air. Right, right. And as you mentioned, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, the parasympathetic tends to be more that recovery, rest, digest, but it makes you calmer, right? Or it actually can calm, um, even, even when you're under stress, you can use it to, to manage the stress. I assume that's yeah. what you do with your fighters is help them manage so they don't get, they don't wear themselves out with breathing unnecessarily when they're kind of in the, in the moment. Yeah, that's correct. Um, even when I'm working on energy system development, um, a lot of fighters are mouth breathers and they're stimulating certain energy pathways uh, just by breathing through their mouth, right? So they're overstimulating that um, sympathetic side of, of it so and even they're training at a higher intensity level so there's definitely an imbalance between those two so that's when oxygen advantage can come into play when i'm doing active recovery or tapering or sessions where we need to deload because mm. there there's definitely a lot of you know how high volume and high intensity of training uh with these uh fighters and athletes so it's a nice way to create balance. And even uh, for, you know, pre-competition, pre-fighting protocols, that's another way that I implement uh, this method. So it prepares the body and the mind in order to perform. Gotcha. So if we take that concept to your average person who's working, you know, 10 hours a day, five days a week, six days a week, and they're just, you know, family, kids, stress, they're trying to get better sleep. How does that, how do those pathways, energy pathways in those sympathetic nervous system um, affect, affect their ability to manage stress and sleep and so forth? Well, it definitely affects, I mean, from a performance standpoint, and I say performance, not in, you know, just to say you're an athlete, you know, mm -hmm. performance for me can be uh, whether you can play with your kids and feel great, so whether you can perform at work or at any task that you need to perform. So uh, that impacts whether you're, have, you're having high energy levels or you're having trouble sleeping or not. So it definitely affects everything. So the way that you manage the stress and how you can cope with that in terms of, you know, applying certain methods that will help you to perform better in your daily life. So breathing or breath work, it, it really comes into play with, with everything, you know, even for your, for your mental health. So if you're, you're having anxiety all the time, you're having high stress or many situations around you that are wearing you down or tearing you down, uh, you definitely need to do um, something about it. And I would say that that's where breath work comes in. So you can do um, from meditation, you can do yoga. There's many ways that you can implement breath work, but I would say that oxygen advantage is pretty simple to apply. You can do that um, while you're getting ready to work, while driving, while working on your computer. You can work on those three uh, pillars that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely, even by doing the first one where you start to create a little bit of air hunger, that one really uh, plays a huge role into creating that balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So yeah. that is something that you can do for four to five minutes. 
and that's it. Hmm. And that will bring you, you know, to that balance. Gotcha. And I do remember seeing something in your feed. I found that's what we connected on Instagram, and it was like, I, 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 it was not only the oxygen advantage, the fact that you're working with fighters. I just, I had to reach out, and, um, but I, I, I saw you discussing something that was quite unrelated to MMA fighters, which was the the uh, connection between breath work or breathing hyperventilation and PMS. Yeah. So please, oh, <laughs> educators, because that's not, that's the first time I've heard anyone mention that. Okay, yeah, it's pretty brand new, to be honest, uh, but I have worked with female fighters, so, you know, mm. I have to be aware of that, and I, I have worked with other female athletes and myself, you know, being a female, sure. so it, we have seen uh, with research and even with different athletes how hyperventilation um it's correlated to pms right so i'm not saying it's 100 percent because of hyperventilation there's uh many other variables that come into play like with everything you know whether we're talking about training or you know performance whatever uh, there's a lot of variables that come into play but especially with females uh you have to be very aware of the menstrual cycle because it's not like men. So women go to under hormonal fluctuations during a cycle of let's say 28 days ish. So it can vary, but 28 is like the average. So the first phase that uh, females go through in, in the menstrual cycle is the follicular phase. So that phase is between day one and 14, just before ovulation. And during those days is where we can perform better, where we have higher energy levels. Estrogen is a little bit higher, so we can undergo through higher intensity training, um, altitude training, which is uh, stronger breath holds if we're talking about breath work. So those days are like our peak. We can perform great during those days. Then it comes ovulation, which is mid-cycle or day 14. Uh, some women or some athletes feel okay. Some of them might start feeling a little bit sluggish during one or two days, but then it goes back up because estrogen peaks up around that time. Mm. So you, you can keep on performing, doing high intensity, higher intensity training, strength training, altitude training, and so on. Then we go into luteal phase, which is, you know, after ovulation and until menstruation comes in. So during that phase is where we are not performing that well. So those days or that phase is where we feel a little bit more tired. Uh, we feel hungry or we have cravings for certain things. Um, we cannot tolerate um, stronger breath holds because that's when progesterone um, goes up and that causes um, less CO2 tolerance. So oh. around so around that phase, the luteal phase, uh, let's say that CO2 drops by 25%. So there's definitely a feeling of, you know, fatigue, breathlessness, and, and those kind of symptoms, especially you're starting to feel cramps, inflamed, and there's less, um, you know, um, bowel awesome. movements right. and so on. So there's a lot of things that might be affected during those days. So I don't advise uh, any female athlete to perform um, stronger breath holds or altitude training where you're holding your breath for longer periods of time because that's going to cause you to feel worse. Sure. So that, that, that's a phase where you can work on active recovery, light deep breathing, um, you can do some stuff more on the parasympath parasympathetic side of, of training and activities. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the hyperventilation would add to the stress, I'm guessing that's already yeah. there, which, Correct. which it would be have a tendency to do because they're already stressed and they're having difficulty recovering anyway. So they're trying to get more oxygen, but it's adding to the problem. I know that, that, you know, that luteal phase endurance is a little bit impaired correct and that's because uh progesterone is way higher so progesterone 
um, it's definitely a stimulator for, you know, for respiratory rate. So that's why it goes up. So um, there's less star tolerance to CO2. That's why you see uh, performance impaired in terms of, you know, endurance or, mm-hmm. or those type of activities. Recovery. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, that's actually a, 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 a advantage that women have with estrogen over men is that they tend to, their endurance levels, when their estrogen is high, their endurance levels are actually much increased. Their recovery is better. They recover between sets, between workouts, much faster than men do. Um, yeah. That with that estrogen, higher estrogen level, it's really beneficial for that recovery and endurance. Yeah. And it's anti inflammatory. So during, right. You know, the first phase where estrogen peaks and goes up, um, it's definitely where we are less inflamed, we feel great, um, our recovery is faster, there is less inflammation on the muscular level and cellular level. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. I hadn't heard of, I hadn't heard that correlated before the breath work as a, as a, as a way to manage that. That's, that's, that's really cool. And, yeah, and that's be- very interesting. And honestly, I think it's a great way for us as coaches to know how to handle a female athlete. That way, you're right. not pushing way harder on the days that you know that athlete it's not going to perform that well. You're going to, you know, instead of improving, you're going to go a step back. So it's a smart way to program around that cycle. Mm. Without overtraining. Avoid overtraining. Right. Avoid- yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, what would be um, some basic, some some baby steps that maybe some of our our listeners could could try? You mentioned the the not so much not box breathing, but the the four second inhale and the five second exhale. That'd be a good thing to start with. Yeah. First, I would start with something that we call the bolt score and the MBT score. Okay. So those two scores are a great way to you know like a baseline just to see where you add in terms of CO2 tolerance. So the bolt score is the body oxygen level test. It's pretty simple, pretty basic. So uh, as soon as you wake up before uh, engaging in any type of activity, you can set your timer, put it, set it. You're gonna inhale normally through your nose. Don't open your mouth and you're gonna exhale. As soon as you exhale, you're gonna pinch your nose or block your nose and start your timer. So at the first uh, definite desire to breathe, you stop the timer. So how are you gonna notice that? You can feel it over here or on your stomach. So the first desire to breathe, it is not how long you can hold it, but the first Mm -hmm. desire to breathe. So you're gonna time that in seconds and you're gonna record that. So if it's a score less than 25, it is, uh, it is not that functional, so there's room for improvement. Even if you have a bold score of 25, there is room for, imp- for improvement as well. So a bold score of 40, that would be the goal, okay? Yeah. So it's something that you can start building up and working on that. That's the first score. So we can see if either you can apply altitude training or stronger breath holds, or you can start with lie deep and slow breathing, which is the basic and the foundation. So the MBT, which is the second score, uh, it's the maximum breathlessness test. Uh, You get up as well. Um, You're gonna inhale, exhale, pinch your nose, and you're gonna start walking. And you're gonna count the maximum number of uh, of steps or paces that you're gonna uh, take. That is the maximum. It is different from the bolt score. Okay. And you record how many steps. So gotcha. those two are correlated in terms of how well you tolerate CO2 and what we need to work on. Hmm. Okay. And of course, if, if you're breathing vertically, I will change it to breathe it horizontally. That would be a first not a good step, first step. Change the way that you breathe, your biomechanics. If you're breathing way too much volume of air every time you breathe or you inhale, slow down and do it half, like the first fundamental we talk about, and start creating a little little bit of hunger. And the other one, like you said, the pace, that's another good way to start 
implementing and changing the respiratory rate and the tidal volume of each um, inhalation and exhalation. So it depends where you at. If you're already implementing a little bit of breath work, probably um, the first uh, pillar is going to be easy for you. So you can move on into the second or the third one. Or probably if you're already doing a little bit way more than that, you can implement the three of them into one exercise and start practicing 10 minutes a day. Hmm. 10 so minutes there's a day. A different way. Yeah, you can start doing that first and then you can start doing it twice a day, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes before going to sleep. Honestly, that's one of the best ways before going to sleep to do light, slow and deep breathing for 10 to 20 minutes. And that is gonna help you to relax, to bring your body into a parasympathetic state so you can have a better night's sleep. Wow, I think everybody's after that right now. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants better sleep right now. Uh, well, that's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, that's, that's amazing. Uh, I think you had some information i think i remember i see a maybe a dropbox oh you sent me that so you had something on the the pms hyperventilation is like an info thing was a dropbox yeah that's um that's some research about it so okay. it was yeah it was something about how it's correlated and it was a study that um perf they performed with certain female athletes so you can see the correlation between the different phases, the menstrual cycle, and how it affects performance in terms of, you know, um, higher hyperventilation and less tolerance to CO2 around the luteal phase. Okay, well, I'll be sure to include that in the show notes. I meant to, I, I remember seeing that, and I, I meant to ask you about it, but I, I, uh, while we were talking about it, but I want to make sure I mentioned that so people know to look for it. Um, so you're, how do people find you or find more, more about what you do? What's the best way to reach out to you or connect with you? Okay, through Instagram. That's the easiest way to reach out to me. So okay. it's at Melissa double S Prieto, P R I I double I T O. I know it's a little bit tricky, my last name. Two eyes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll put that in the show notes as well. And uh, sure. and I have your emails as well. Over there, it's my, yeah, it's my email as well. They can reach out to me through email or Instagram. That's the easiest way to reach out. Okay. Great. Great. So you, so you do maybe, a, so when you do coaching, is it like a, like a series of weeks? I would assume this is something that takes some time to, to really get kind of get under your belt. Is that something where you work with someone for like three, four weeks before they really start to, um, how soon would you say someone might see a, a notice a difference in, in just how they carry themselves or how they are they're in their, in their stress state, when do you usually start seeing improvements or in their, in their, in their mechanics? True. So you're talking about breath work, right? Breath work. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if we're talking about exclusively breath work uh, training, yes. Um, the shortest program that I have, it's four weeks. And honestly, it's something that it's not only four weeks. It is something that the athlete or the person can apply I mean, as long as they want to. So it is not like we're done at four weeks mark and then you're good to go and you're not yeah. going to do anything else. No, it is something that stays with you and you keep on performing and doing it over and over because uh, you're going to start progressing each week. So there's athletes that start with a lower bolt score around 18, let's say, and around the third, the third week mark, you can improve on to 25, 28, and so on. So the goal is to, first of all, it's to implement into your training. So let's say I'm, I'm currently working with, a, with an athlete. She's a, she's a runner, a distance runner. And she wanted to know how to apply the method into her training. Mm. So same thing that I do with fighters. I do with, with, with that athlete, okay? So I start to know what her history is, what she does around training, what type of training she's um, doing, uh, intensity, volume, how many sessions, at what time. So as soon as I know that, you know, the whole thing the, um, of it, I can start letting her know how to start implementing certain exercises progressively 
so she can, you know, improve in terms of recovery, uh, running times, and pre-competition and competition. So the shortest program, yeah, it's four weeks, but it can go until, you know, up to 12 weeks. That sure. would be like, you know, like the longest ones, but it is something that you can keep on implementing over time. Also, I think you'd want to implement it into not, not only a 10, like you mentioned, a, a 10 minutes, you know, early in the day and, and before you go to bed, but something you put, you integrate with your training uh, as well to improve performance, even in that sport. But I would think it'd just be another element of, of difficulty, of adaptation when you, when you bring the, the training and the breathing together. Um, that's great. Does it, I guess. Yeah, it's would... harder. Definitely. Oh, it's, it... it is. It is even the way that I, I run the warm ups for every athlete. It's a little bit different because that's when I first uh, implement one of the exercises from oxygen advantage. And it's a way for, for us to prepare the body for the upcoming sessions and the upcoming demands. So it's basically small breath holds during your warm up. Mm. So you're holding your breath while you're doing your warm up. So it definitely becomes a little bit harder than, you know, than the usual, usual warm up because a lot of athletes uh, talk too much during the warm up or they're opening their mouth. So <laughs> definitely I force them to not to do that. Wow. That's great. That's fantastic. Cause it's, it's, uh, it's a bringing in another element to your training that I would think help you push through some plateaus as well because another way to do it without adding weight you're not adding distance you're not adding speed you're you're managing breath and so yeah. you've got another lever to add to your training protocol that brings benefits that, you, that many people aren't addressing at all yeah that's true and honestly i mean breathing it's basic you know it's it's a thing it's a function that it's basic right. but not many people are doing it the right way, you know. Or realize they're doing I, it the wrong way. They don't realize they're doing it the wrong way. They don't exactly. realize the, the benefit. And it's very different from so many people are familiar with because of just notoriety and 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 dr drama, really is Wim Hof. Not to take anything away from Wim Hof. Uh Iceman, you know, get all those running in the cold and the and the high elevation yeah. and the but his breath work. And his style of breath work is quite different from oxygen advantage. It's it's, totally. it's almost polar opposite, uh, almost. Yeah. Uh, in that there's a lot of breath breathing through the mouth. It's very uh, there's a lot of hyperventilation. There's a lot of there's an abundance of air, an abundance of breathing. Whereas you are really managing, controlling, and limiting, in some cases, the amount of air coming in. So it's quite a quite a different approach. It is very different and I get this question a lot like which one is better and you know what are the main differences but I mean it is great but as everything as every tool that you have in your toolbox has a place and a time to apply that tool right or that method uh, that that's the same thing for me as a strength and conditioning coach talking about um, your periodization or programming those kind of things so same goes with cryotherapy um, you know, that type of breathing such as Wim Hof, because Wim Hof blows a lot of CO2 out. So you're not working in that CO2 tolerance. So definitely you're not going to, you know, have way more aerobic capacity in terms of tolerating that CO2. And you are stimulating that sympathetic side of it all the time so right i'm very careful in terms of not over stimulating uh either parasympathetic or sympathetic because if you go to one extreme or the other you can have um not the result that you might have in mind or want to so even for uh the fighters out that, that i work with the pre-competition or the pre-fight protocol that I use, it's a mixed one. So we do a little bit of kind of Wim Hof. We do light, deep breathing, and then we do breath holds, strong breath holds. So it's a mix of, of three, you know, mm -hmm. methods. So that way I'm not overstimulating uh, the athlete to be you no know, totally parasympathetic, you know, cause they're, they might fall asleep. 
and they need to fight they need to go out and beat the hell out of someone mm-hmm. in that cage but i need to be careful as well in terms of not overstimulating the sympathetic side of it because that can throw you off as well mm-hmm. right so that's why i say everything has a time and place in order for you to apply it into your programming gotcha gotcha that's amazing that's that's awesome uh to to bring that in again with the, with that level of, of performance athlete um i would imagine it's got to be uh pretty pretty precise i mean you've got to you 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 know what you're doing going in there uh because his <laughs> he's he's putting his body on the line like he's for he's, sure yeah there's, yeah there's, there's a lot of things on the line and i mean it's it's risky it's crazy uh, yeah. but you know, it's, it's an art, honestly. Oh, for sure. No doubt. There's a, they put a lot of time and, and training into their art. And, and I think this is an aspect that most people just don't realize. I think it's all technique and then endurance and, and, and realize that, uh, you know, if it's, and if it works for someone performing on that level, then, then it certainly could translate to someone just having a better management of their stress and their life dealing with work like you said family a little bit yeah. of their own activity and just wanting to live longer live better have a longer health span um and it's probably an aspect that they're not addressing so True. it's for everyone i mean yeah. it's it's not exclusively for high level athletes it's for everyone i right. think that as i said majority of population doesn't breathe properly they have a lot of dysfunctional breathing patterns and by dysfunctional, I mean, you're doing mouth breathing, vertical breathing, um, you snore or probably you're, you know, waking up with your mouth dry, you cannot focus, you cannot perform. So that's, those are like the signs of dysfunctional breathing patterns. So it is definitely for everyone and you can benefit from it. Um, whether you're a high level athlete or just someone that loves uh, to do sports on the regular basis, or you're a parent that needs to relax a little bit more and, you know, uh, control anxiety or stress. Yeah. So you, so you, you address uh, sleep, dysfunctional sleep as well then. So snoring and, and mouth breathing during, during um, sleep and so forth. So that would, that is a, that is a health risk. That's a huge health risk. So you, yep. so you have clients that you help correct that as well? Yeah, for sure. And even with fighters, uh, that's very common because they have a lot of injuries on their faces, Sure. you know, due to high volume of punches in their face. So there's a lot of broken noses and this area of the sinus area, it's damaged. So a lot of fighters have troubles with, you know, sleeping patterns. A lot of them snore or have, you know, collapsed airways. So that's another way that you can, you know, start having troubles of sleeping. So with breath work, that's another way that you can start working on that. You can use mouth taping uh, before sleep or during sleep, or even a nasal dilator. That's something that I use a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Those two things are very helpful in terms of um, sleep quality. Yeah, I've done both of those. Actually, I help help with that. It's it is very very helpful. Uh, awesome. Anything you'd want to add? Anything I may have overlooked and asked you about that you think would be important for people to to understand? No, I think we kind of covered uh, a little bit of everything. Of course, yeah. is everything it's on the surface because um, right. you know each subject has a depth to it and there's a lot of variables that go or come into play but i would say that you better start doing nasal breathing so you guys out there start doing nasal breathing it's definitely going to change um, your quality of life and your perspective about how functional you can be if you start using your nose as i say uh, the mouth is to chew and eat and the nose is to breathe so we okay. we better start using our nose and and even now you know what with all this COVID thing and everything your nose is your first line of defense mm. so that's a way you can protect your lungs you can protect your airways and you can protect your health 
But if you're not breathing properly and on top of that, we are wearing masks and all of that, it's going right. to be, you know, something that it's going to be eventually a problem. So that, that would be my advice. Start breathing through your nose most of the time. Start yeah. breathing. Yes, yes. And for athletes, because a lot of times I get this question. So if I'm an athlete, should I breathe nasally 100% of the time? No. So anything less than VO2 max or maximum intensity, you can do it nasally. If yeah. you're performing um, higher intensity uh, bouts or sessions or anything that it goes beyond the threshold, you can apply breathing gears. So that that's another way. So you can go nasal, 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 mouth, 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 and then go back, mouth, nasal, nasal, nasal. So it's like a car. Let's say, you know, like gears in a car. So depending on the intensity of the training that you're performing that you're doing, if you feel that you need to open your mouth, do it, but do it from your diaphragm and go back as soon as you can to nasal breathing. I see. So use it, use what you need to through your mouth and diaphragm for, for some quick recovery and then yep. come back to nasal as quickly as, as possible. It's like doing sprints, high intensity work, uh, interval training, circuits stuff like that and just when you get to that high point where you're like i need this i'm gonna pass out <laughs> yeah i'm gonna go back to that gear <laughs> yeah exactly gotcha. the only thing that you want to might have in mind or want to have in mind is do it for your diaphragm so instead of me doing i do it you know it's barely perceptible you're doing the same thing that as, as i said push your ribs out and then in through your mouth and as soon as you feel you're getting back to your rhythm and you can go back to nasally you can do it so that that's a nice way to play with breath work um, especially for athletes that are performing certain you know drills that are very high intensity um, and i see that with fighters especially with sparring sessions or with wrestling that that can work as well so mm. yeah Right, that diaphragmic breathing brings more air deeper into the lungs, to the lower part of the lungs, as opposed to the chest yes. breathing kind of just stays trapped here, doesn't it? So true, and there's um, there's around 150 milliliters of dead space in our lungs. So if we start to work on nasal breathing, that space is going to become less because of the production of nitric oxide. That oh. is going to help to you know to redistribute the blood and the air in your lungs so there it's going to be less blood on the lower part of your lungs and it's going to be way more you know um way more all over instead of having dead space wow okay i didn't know that that's that's cool well thank you sure. Melissa. i'm gonna no, have uh, you. yeah i have your have your your handle your ig handle and your email in the show notes um and I, I encourage people to reach out to Melissa for for if this interests you reach out for coaching for some one-on-one -on -one coaching um I think you mentioned you might give our listeners a little uh special entry discount maybe yeah. in your coaching <laughs> yeah that's true so for your audience if they reach out to me and if they listen to the whole podcast <laughs> <laughs> I might point. do a podcast yeah, I might do a question or something, but if you DM me or send me an email that you listen uh, to Saints podcast, um, I will be glad to give you a 50% off in the first consultation so we can, I can see where you at and how can I help. And based on that, I can offer you a program. As I said, the shortest one is four weeks, but depending on the athlete or the person's need, we can start working on from that. But on the first consultation, that will be a 50 off if you guys listen to this amazing podcast. Thank you. <laughs> so we appreciate that. I, I appreciate that. I really hope people take advantage of that because it's uh, you need some instruction to get started on this to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and see the benefits right. and get that, just the benefits of coaching through something new. You've got to create new habits you need you need to have someone who's who's guiding you right even us coaches need coaches <laughs> absolutely 
hundred percent. Right? Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you, Melissa. I appreciate your, your time. And um, we'll, uh, like I said, I put those in the show notes and I appreciate your offer to my listeners. It's been great and, 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 uh, and insightful. Um, when's your next fight? So um, that'll be Miami, November 12th. So oh, it's pretty that's soon. My birthday. Oh, great. Who is oh, it? really? Mine yeah. is November 10th. Oh, We're wow. <laughs> yes. So you're going to be in Miami for, who is it? Who's, who's your high fighter? Hugo Flores. He's a oh, guy, wow. he, he, he's living in Chicago, but he's such a great fighter. Um, hopefully it, it'll go great. So we're yeah. gonna work up uh, i mean i'm going um to do other stuff as well over there work stuff with fighters as well and with the uh, human performance university in florida mm. so yeah i'll be there a couple of days and then we have fights coming up and there's bellator as well um same day but that will be later that night bellator wow okay. awesome well good luck with your fighters uh, that's so that's much. exciting exciting yeah thank you so much for having me absolutely have a great week <laughs>